of shooting someone. And then, again, at the age of 16, he has spent one year at Rikers. Uh, and, of course, his bail was $250,000. And we understand that no one has that type of money to bail their young people out, right? Their children out. And so there's organizations that came together to bail him out. He's now with his family. Um, you're going to hear from different clergy folks as well as organizations that have been working with Pedro. Um, and also you're going to hear from individuals uh, that are going to represent his family as well. So we thank you. Um, my co-host for today is Supreme. Supreme is an individual who had uh, shared this story with Sean King, who's an activist, and rallied a lot of us up. So I want to thank him for that. Um, but so if we can have you say a couple words and then we'll start with the program. Thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, hopefully, Miss Clark upstairs, she'll dismiss all the charges after the rally. Thank you. All right, so we have Reverend Ruben Austria, who's going to be speaking. He's with Community Connections for you. I'll put the hand. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. because you are the one who, when you came on the scene, you yourself proclaimed that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free. And so we come today to proclaim freedom for those who are in prison, freedom for the oppressed, good news for the poor. God, as we gather before you in the face of, a, of an unjust system, uh, one that's marked by brutality and harassment and corruption and, and harsh foot punishment, a system that puts children in cages. God, we cry out to you because we know that you are the God of justice. We know that it's your will that your people experience freedom and liberty. And so, God, we pray today, God, we pray for Pedro. We thank you that he's home with his family, but we know, God, the the scars, the wounds that he's had to endure, the battles they still face ahead. We pray for them, God, that your spirit would be near them, that you would strengthen them and comfort them. God, we pray for every other child that is still sitting in Rikers uh, on that torture chamber of an island. We pray, God, we know that you are near to those who are in prison, and so we pray that you would be manifest, that you would see them through, that you would be put children out of bondage as well. God, we even pray for those who work in the system, my God. And we don't demonize them as people, but we know that, that even good people working in a broken system can make broken decisions. But we know that you can still raise up individuals within those systems who will uh, go with their conscience, who will be agents of truth and righteousness and justice. So we pray even now in these buildings around us that you would pierce the hearts and the conscience of those who are overseeing this case and that true justice and true light righteousness would come. God, we pray for ourselves, God. Because you know that even we ourselves are not righteous and so many of the things that, that we decry in this unjust system we also see in ourselves. So we ask that you would purify us and, and, and forgive us for the things we've done wrong in this fight ahead. But God, we thank you that, that even though still many are locked up today, even though this case is not resolved yet, God, we believe that we will have victory because you are the God that leads people out of bondage. God, you led your children out of bondage into the promised land. God, you led people through years of slavery in this country. God, and you will lead our people out, God, even through today, God, through the demon of mass incarceration, this new Jim Crow. God, you will bring freedom and justice because your word says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are God. So we ask that your justice come, your righteousness come, your freedom come to your people. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be bringing up the private investigator, Manuel Gomez, who's been working with the family, was hired by the family to do their own investigation. He's going to share some words. I want to say, uh, first of all, thank you for everyone coming. Um, and I want to thank Senator Chinaris and uh, Senator Rivera as well. Um, 
A year and a half ago, Jessica Perez came to me asking help for her son. I did not realize the magnitude of my investigation would uncover the fact that more than 50 other kids are currently incarcerated by these two corrupt detectives, Detective Daniel Brady and Detective David Terrell. But on top of that, I didn't realize or even phantom that it would get to the point that I found evidence showing that the assistant district attorney, David Slott, has falsified these cases with them. And not only falsified the cases with them, but put in letters for them to be promoted because of these false arrests. This case has now uncovered a hornet's nest of corruption on the sixth floor of Darcel Clark's office. I'm going to be going to the state attorney general to ask to put charges against, with my evidence, against the assistant district attorney David Slot, Detective David Terrell, and Detective Daniel Brady, because they need to be in jail. Okay? Um, the fact of the matter is, thank you. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that not only do I do investigations in the Bronx, but I conduct investigations throughout the state of New York. I have uncovered masses of amount of corruption from Syracuse, Albany, Brewster, White Plains, Mahala, Nassau, Suffolk, and all the boroughs within New York. This corruption has to, put, has to stop. So Frank Serpico and I have created a new bill called the Department of Civilian Justice, a proposal that we're trying to make now that will give oversight over the district attorney's office and over the department or the police department department of corrections. Again, there is no mechanism now currently for an average citizen to report this type of corruption. All right, Frank Serpico talked about this in 1971. There has been no change, except now Frank and I have created a blueprint and we've asked the senators to now cause hearings on this and soon there will be. So I'd like you all to come when that happens to support this. We must stop. Screaming justice and no peace gets you nowhere. We need to have legislation that will create oversight. I want to thank you for your time. Good job. Good job. Now we're going to hear from Lila Martinez, who has also been working uh, with the family closely. She's from Beyond the Box Initiative and the National Council Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Hi, everybody. So I'm here today because I am this community. I am the Bronx. I was born and raised right here in this city. And not only that, I'm also the mother of an 18-year-old son. And when I saw Pedro's story, I only reflected my son. We cannot wait until it is our kids that are impacted to wake up and to do something about things. Our kids are not criminals. They're not, they, they need to be identified as people and that's what they need to be treated as. We need to make sure that our kids are protected and we need to be a voice for our kids. We need to stand up. We need to fight for our kids, their freedom all the time. I'm sorry, hold on. <laughs> okay. Our kids need to be protected from the corrupt system. Our kids need to be... I'm sorry. No, you good. Take your time. Breathe in. <laughs> yeah. When I often speak about how I am afraid for my child from not people that are in the street trying to make a living but from police officers I'm afraid of the people who are paid to protect and serve my child I'm afraid of what they might do to him what I get back is oh well there's nothing to worry about if he doesn't do anything so I need those people to ask the Central Park Five if that is a true statement That's right. I need them to ask Shabaka Shakur, who That's did right. 27 and a half years right. for a crime he did not commit, if that is a true statement. I need them to ask Derek Hamilton, who did 30 years for a crime he did not commit, if that is a true statement. Right. I need them to ask Pedro Hernandez, who did 13 months for a crime that there is overwhelming evidence that he did not commit, if that is a true statement. That's right. That's I right. need them to stop 
incriminating our kids is to stop falsifying evidence against them. I need them to stop killing us. That is what I need them to do. We need to stand up for our kids always. Thank you. Yeah. Now we're gonna hear from Nicole Triplett from the New York Civil Liberties Union. Thank you. Um, Pedro's story disturbs us at um, New York Civil Liberties Union and CPR. Not only is the system failing our communities, but this story reflects and shows how the system is lodging a full-on attack on our community. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a speedy trial right that still remains non-existent in New York. That it permits kids, New Yorkers, to wait months, if not years, for trial. That's right. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a cash bail system that by definition is inhumane and unjust to be able to attach a, a fee to someone's liberty. What also am I talking about? I'm talking about police not being held accountable to the communities they actually serve. Yeah. Word. That's right. Sure, the system is broken and, and this it another face, we have another years. face to this injustice and a lot of work is going to be done. But enough is enough. Enough is enough to our mayors, enough is enough to our governors, enough is enough to our DAs, and we've got to hold them accountable. And we at Nike are encouraging people to get out and vote and hold yes. these people accountable. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good work. We're gonna have a statement read from Assemblyman Michael Blake. Dom. Hello everyone, my name is Dom Leon Davis. I'm here on behalf of Assemblymember Michael Blake. I'm gonna read a brief statement. For too long, Bronxites and many New Yorkers have been victims of a criminal justice system that is stacked against them. It is our job to advocate for a fair and just process where everyone gets a chance, no matter your financial situation, last name, title, or zip code. The school to prison pipeline continues to break down our communities, unfairly targeting young people of color. Here in the South Bronx, we have far too many extraordinary young people, like Pedro Hernandez, a scholar and mentor to for many, being held on charges and in uh, on uh, incorrect charges and inhumane conditions without due process of the law. From what we have learned through public and private accounts, there's significantly different versions of what has occurred with Pedro. However, it's clear that he, like so many young people, are incarcerated for far too long and denied fair opportunities far too quickly. As we work to improve our criminal justice system, we must level the playing field so that economic conditions do not determine justice. No one should be denied justice because they can't decide between bread or bail. We're proud to have sponsored a bill that makes it easy for charitable bail organizations to post bail, but we still have work to do. As elected leaders, we have the moral imperative to fight for policies like raise the age, bail and grand jury reform, and closing Rikers. We must focus on alternative sentencing, open discovery, discovery for justice, to create a fair judicial process, and community services for those both in and out of the system. Our youth deserve better. Our families deserve better. Justice and equity are our expectations and should not be the exception. We cannot rest until both become standard for all of us, not just some of us. Thank you. So before we bring on the next speaker, I also want to recognize that there are people in the audience that are part of the NYPD 12. There's also a mother here who has a sign about her son being incarcerated with a $500,000 bill. And so I just want you to know that we recognize you and we see you and we thank you for being here and continuing to advocate for your family and for your son. Uh, we're going to go ahead and bring on Senator Gustavo Rivera from the Bronx, um, who has done a lot of work with us around the Raise the Age campaign. He's also worked with us on some of our criminal justice initiatives, and so please welcome him. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm here standing with advocates, my fellow colleagues in government, uh, victims of the criminal justice system, to ask a very simple question. Do we believe in justice? And if you believe in justice, what does that mean? Now, I'm happy that Mr. Adams is home with his folks, with his family, so he can fight the charges at home and not have to be sitting in Rikers. The reality is that there are thousands of young people like him. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do we need to do? What are, the, what are the pushes that we need to make in the system, both internally and externally, to make sure that we have a justice system that is actually just? And many policies that we've been able to pursue in the state 
changing the age of criminal responsibility that was an achievement that was done by many of the people that are sitting here, that are standing here right now. That was a big win. But obviously that is not the only one that we have to seek. We are seeking to close Rikers because we believe in a place that ultimately does not bring justice and ultimately treats a system that is not supposed to be punitive. If somebody is waiting for trial. They should not be punished while they're waiting for trial. So there's a lot of things that we have to do in the policy sphere. And as an elected official, as a state senator, and somebody has stood for this issue for many years as I've been in the Senate, I will continue to do so. I commit myself to fighting along with the advocates here, the victims of the criminal justice system here, and my fellow colleagues in government to make sure that we get those things done. And one of the folks that is fighting for that, and there's a bill that I am co-sponsor of, and I want to introduce him to you so you can talk a little bit about the work that he's doing. And it's a bill that we hope to be able to pass very soon in the New York State Senate and the state of New York, which would change the narrative on bail. And that is my colleague from Queens, State Senator Michael Genos. Thank you. Good morning. We are here today to talk about only the latest tragedy that has come out of our criminal justice system. And I say the latest because Pedro Hernandez is one of thousands that have experienced injustice at the hands of our court system. I know we have uh, members of Cleef Browder's family here with us today as well. Everybody knows his case. A young man spent three years in jail for a crime he did not commit, a very low-level crime at that, uh, and ended up taking his own life because of the experience he had. Uh, Pedro Hernandez, over a year in jail without even having the chance to prove his innocence, which he'll get next month. Now, why is that happening? It's happening because we have a bail system that is unjust in our society. A rich person and a poor person, accused of the same exact crime. A rich person is walking in the streets while they wait for trial. A poor person is locked up, usually in Rikers Island, because they cannot afford to purchase their freedom. That is what our criminal justice system has wrought right now. It is inherently discriminating against poor people in our society, and it is grossly unfair. It takes our system of innocence until proven guilty that we all learn when we're growing up, and it turns it upside down, because if you don't have money in our society, you can't get out of jail before you have a chance to prove your innocence. So where's the fairness in that? Let me tell you something. Some of these crimes are very low level. About 40% of people who are offered bail of $500 cannot afford it. And they sit in jail waiting, sometimes for years and years, just to get the chance to have their due process and get out. So what do they do? The prosecutors come to them and they say, well, we'll give you a plea deal. Plead guilty to something less, you get out today. Or you could sit in Rikers for another couple of years and wait. And the time they spend in Rikers is usually longer than the time they would get punished if they're convicted at a trial. And so kids like Khalif Brown, kids like Pedro Hernandez, they have the courage to say, I am not pleading guilty to something I did not do. Sit in jail and wait. They're denied their freedom in some of the most important years of their lives because the system is unjust. And let's be clear what bail is used for. It's not supposed to be used this way, but it is used to imprison poor kids in our communities before they get to prove their innocence. Somebody commits a crime, they should do the punishment for it. But these things are happening before anyone has a chance to show that they didn't do what they're accused of doing. And so years at a time, in jail, for things they didn't do, it's unjust. We need to get rid of bail. You heard Gustavo, uh, my colleague Gustavo Rivera talk about this. We are trying to eliminate bail in New York State. Let's end the injustice once and for all, and we're going to work until we make it happen. Thank you. And that's a nice seg segue into our next speaker. I want to introduce um, somebody who's really special to me, who I've been organizing with. I remember I met him the first time that Justice League had done a rally in memory of Khalif Browder. Um, and I also got to meet his beautiful mom, who every single day advocated for her son, Vieta. And so I'm going to bring up Akeem Browder. Thank you. First uh, and foremost, I want to thank the press that's here today because without you guys telling the truth of our stories, of our stories in our communities, of our poor black and brown communities, it wouldn't be televised or talked about without you guys, but then we come into, uh, into play as advocates that will march, that will rally, that will get together for our communities. So the first and foremost, thank you for the press on telling the, on the, our stories. Second. 
as um, Mike just said, as everyone is going to say, and uh, Senator Gustavo, I thank you, um, as they all say, we are talking about kids, people. We are talking about human beings nonetheless. Whether we're black or brown, whether, whether we have money or not, we're talking about kids. And what happens when you lock up kids, you lock up the families. You lock up the mothers who die because they have heart attacks from what happens to the fear in them when their kid goes to someplace like Rikers. But let's not get it twisted. This jail, or the, and this court who, and that houses, that court that my brother went to, and this DA who was the judge on my brother's case for the longest period of time, these jails are not Rikers. And Rikers is not all jails. But Rikers is one of the most tormentous places that we have in New York City, right in our own backyard. So when are we going to stop? When do we get a chance to have ourselves looked at as human beings instead of the monsters that make and they make us? We're innocent until proven guilty, are we not? Yeah. Yes. We're innocent. And this is all that we're here to say today. He's innocent. You know that in, in the charges against him is fraudulent. So let us go. Don't hold our families hostage anymore. Don't let our mothers cry and die anymore. When a, when a family loses their, we lose our whole family just like what happens with mine. We go to too many funerals in our communities. And when are we going to stop? When is the mayor or incumbent right now going to take a stand for his uh, for our people? We're, we're the people of New York that he is supposed to represent. And yet we are not being represented only when it comes time for re-election. That's when you start hearing talk of closing Rikers, when we on the streets constantly want to close Rikers. But we also want to do away with the age-old system of holding people in jail, tormenting them until we find out that they're innocent and more than likely until they take a plea. This happens to every one of us. This is not one isolated incident. Every incident is not supposed to be compared to my brother or to the next person or to the next person. We're individual people that are suffering. So when we're talking about Pedro today, yes, there are a lot of people that's in jail, but we're talking about Pedro today. We need justice for Pedro today. DA Clark, you are a DA and you told us in your inauguration that you would not stand for this anymore, although you did it to Khalif. You told Khalif that in, in court while he was there, that you're gonna teach him a lesson before he was even considered innocent or guilty. So when are we gonna have our rights done and held the, on the way that it's supposed to? Now is on the time. No more talking about it. We demand justice now. Thank you. When we talk about our families, we talk about also have to mention the mothers, right? The mothers that are sitting by waiting for their children to come home. And so I wanna bring up a, a very special woman by the name of Jeanette Bocanegra, who represents the Community Connections for Youth, but she's a woman who's been advocating because she's also had a son who's formerly incarcerated. I'm here today with families and young people to support Pedro Hernandez Jessica Perez and the entire family to say enough is enough. Basta ya with your sex excessive abuse of police authority. As a mother of a returned citizen, I too experienced the horrible treatment of incarceration and the systemic trauma of incarceration. Let's not forget Khalif Browder. Ten years, ten years is too long to shut Rikers down. A broken system. Across the country, there are places where verbal abuse are being repaid by physical injuries in these prisons and solitary confinement with the mental abuse. Let's not forget Khalif Browder. We stand in solidarity today with all those that are behind those gated walls. As a family member, we will unlock our children's future. At CCFY, we believe that communities when financially resourced, we can do a better job than the system in taking care of our children, than the criminal system have done for generations. We demand no more kids be put in cages. We ask that solitary confinement be ended. 
We ask that the bail reform be changed. We need have to meet. The people united will never, never be, be divided. divided. The people united will never be divided. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. The people united will never be divided. The people united will never be divided. Thank you. I did not get taller. <laughs> So I think it's important to also recognize that we have Pedro's family here, Jessica Perez and her son, Luis Hernandez. So let's give them a round of applause. And so we're gonna continue with the program uh, and bring up a sister who's been working with us for quite some time in the education system. Zakia Anzari, Alliance for Quality Education, and a proud Justice League member. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am the advocacy director for a statewide alliance called the Alliance for Quality Education. Uh, I'm a mother of eight, grandmother of three, um, and as Carmen said, a proud member of Justice League. And as I sat there listening to everyone speak before me, my, head, my heart just gets heavier and heavier. Because the fight that I've been doing for the last 17 years for educational justice, right, absolutely is connected to the struggle of, of Pedro and what's happening with him. They put him in a prison and they thought they were going to lock up his spirit and his body. And he fooled them all. He said, I will be free and liberated even in this space by getting an education. I will get my high school diploma. Not only will I get a high school diploma, I will get a college scholarship. That's the power of what our black and brown babies do, even in the toughest times. Trying to lock up our minds doesn't lock up our hearts. When we know what we want, when we're ready to fight for it like we are here, for justice, for Pedro, he showed great courage. 10 years. Someone said, the mayor thinks it takes 10 years to close Rikers. There's something Hell interesting no. about that 10 years. The governor thinks it takes 10 years to fund billions of dollars to hold our school. It's been 10 years since we funded our schools. And at the same time, we have children, guess what, who look very much like Pedro, who have lost art, music, and a whole host yes. of programs and resources. And our public schools are set up for sabotage. 10 years again, guess what, as we work for raising the age right this year. Right. 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 Kids have to wait 10 years and have their to, for their records to be sealed. What? Guess what? The commonality is that it's black and brown children and communities once again saying you got to wait. Yes. So we stand here to say, no, we don't have to wait. Um, we are community. We vote. We care. And so justice for Pedro means justice for everyone. Right. It is our job. It is our obligation. As the Sada says, we have nothing to lose but our chains. Yes. And if we don't believe that, then we're not in the right struggle. So yes. I'm going to end by saying, I want you to hold up. I'm trying to figure out how to show some love for Pedro, who's not here. And my heart and my fingers weren't coming out quite right. So I said, you know what, let me look at what is the sign language? What is, how do we say love in sign language? So I'm going to ask everybody to hold up their hands like this. Send love to Pedro, his family, and his friends. And then I want you to close your fist like this and send, send power and strength for the trauma that he's experienced but for the healing that we want to make sure that him and his family receive. Justice for Pedro. Yeah. 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 And now I'm going to bring Vidal Guzman up who is a young man who was on Rikers as well and represents the Close Rikers campaign. Thank you. Uh, hey. well, how you doing everybody? So 26, you know, I'm 26, 10 years ago, I was in Rikers Island. Uh, the first time I stepped on Rikers, I was 16 years old. One of the things that I thought about when I stepped on Rikers, is this family, are they keeping people in there that are teenagers like me and Rikers? You know, a kid that could have just kind of just been like, my first time stepping on Rikers, the first day, with the brace of someone trying to 
try to, you know, try to tell me like, what's up? You know what I'm saying? What you about? The second day, someone told me, they said, man, you can't let that happen, man. If you let that happen, man, they're going to keep doing that. And my mindset was like, I'm not going to be the victim to anything. So I started fighting. But the thing about it is, this, this one week that I was in there changed my life forever. This one week, I seen three guys hang themselves back to back, back to back, back to back. And when you see that, that's what changes your mind of what jail is. When people are taking their life, and when you see that, when you see, have the image in your, in your mind as you see someone hang themselves. My first time, I've been through everything. I've been homeless, I was gang related. You know what I'm saying? I remember uh, my mom was an immigrant, but this right here told me I was in a different world. And this, the scars of me being a Rikers, the fighting, the endorsed your pain that was happening to me. When I was 18, I came home when I was 18 on probation. But the hurt that Rikers created, created a pain that mentally, physically, and emotionally broke me down. I didn't have no counseling therapy to return back to society. So my way to tell people my pain was by fighting. Everybody's thinking like, you know, this kid, you know, lost his mind. But at the end of the day, I was a victim of Rikers. I was a victim of hurt and pain. And when I was 18, I was still doing the same things. Still doing the same things. And what people don't understand that Rikers has just broke me down it broke my whole family. At this time right now in America, none of my uncles are here. None of my friends that. I lost friends that would never come home. I lost friends that you never see. I was out here with the person that would have to look over, look over all the time. 